Hello, and welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about the so-called method of characteristics. We'll show its origin, history, derivation, and a few short examples in this particular class. Let's get started. I like to start with a quote. In figure 364, I show one particular picture of none other than Dr. Theodore von Karman of Caltech and JPL. And he said, everyone knows it takes a woman nine months to have a baby. But you Americans think if you get nine women pregnant, you can have a baby in a month. This is a very strange quote. Let's understand its context and why it's related to method characteristics. He said this to Joseph Martin, who was an aide to General Daniel Hooks, as Martin escorted doc Dr. Carmen from New York City to lead a secret symposium on spaceflight in Crawford, New Mexico. Indeed, the Soviet Union just launched Sputnik a month before, and every branch of the U.S. military had a separate space program, and were desperately trying to get off a successful launch. So you can see every part of the military, and NASA, of course, was trying to launch rockets, and they were all doing it separately. And so this was the analogy that, of course, Dr. Carmen discussed. Indeed, he often taught the method of characteristics, and we'll show other quotes from him in relation to it. Let's get started with the method of characteristics. First, there's some particular philosophy of the method of characteristics which we'll present. The goal of the method of characteristics is to predict a supersonic flow. The name comes, of course, from mathematical theory and partial differential equations. We'll illustrate the so-called method of characteristics be before developing our rigorous approach of this class. Let's develop some preliminary mathematical tools and ideas with respect to characteristics first. First, we might have a Taylor expansion of some variable u in equation 561 of this slide deck. And we might write u of i plus 1 of j will be equal to u of i j plus partial u partial x at i j delta x plus higher order terms. This is nothing but the Taylor expansion about u on some particular discretized coordinate system into point i plus 1 over some spacing delta x, for example. Delta x is the spacing from grid point or point in space i and i plus 1. Of course, there could be an infinite number of points in the space, but the equation holds at any point i. We could, say, put in i for 2 at grid point 2 and put in the variables to find the so-called locations. So you can see, in this case, we can approximate a downstream location at i plus 1 if we know u and partial u partial x at one particular location. This is the idea of our application of the Taylor series expansion in a spatial direction from some known variable u. Indeed, we can then find the values of the derivatives from the conservation equations. For example, in your previous classes, you should have derived a two-dimensional irrotational flow equation. I've written this in 562 for your convenience. Here, for two-dimensional irrotational flow, we have 1 minus u squared over c squared times partial u partial x plus 1 minus v squared over c squared partial v partial y minus 2 uv over c squared times partial u partial y is 0. So we have a single equation here for u and v for 2D irrotational flow. Now we can solve this particular equation for partial u partial x. And 562 solving for partial u partial x will result in the equation 563, which is of course the sum of 2 uv over c squared times partial u partial y minus 1 minus v squared over 2 partial v partial y, all over 1 minus u squared over c squared. We can then see that I, since I've solved for partial u partial x, I can see some relation with 561. Now, let's apply this Taylor series expansions with some types of basic equations and do substitutions to try and form method of characteristics in a second. Before we do that, I want to make some notes about the general philosophy, philosophy of the method of characteristics. First, assume that we know the velocity at a single point i and j and a particular vertical line. This is the line where we know the solution and will vary j. For example, in the Taylor series expansion of 561, we're holding 
lines j constant, for instance, but they might be functions of, say, j plus 1 or j minus 1. i, as we increment it into positive values, of course, will increase from i, say, 2 to 3 to 4, etc., as we march downstream. j might be held constant in the particular equation. So, j will be the vertical line direction and all adjoining points along the line, as we show in figure 365. So there's an x direction, for example, and a y direction. The y direction will be cross-stream for now, and we'll say that there's some kind of characteristic line which varies with the index j, say j, j plus 1, and j minus 1. So you can see as we increment j above and below, we can go to other known values which are discretized in the method of characteristics line. If we increment i plus 1, of course, we would go to the next line over, or de-increment i and go to the next line to the left. So we can indeed calculate partial u, partial y, and calculate all the right-hand side of our developed equations and find a particular partial u, partial x to advance our solution. Now you'll note that in some cases it could be possible that the denominator of the method would be zero. In this case, we would have what we call a sonic condition, that is u equals c. And therefore, we cannot technically be crossing sonic conditions to go to subsonic flow. Here, our method of characteristics will only be valid mathematically and physically for flows that are supersonic. We can also define particular Mach angles again, and these will go according to our formal definition, which we previously defined, as mu is the Mach angle, and therefore sine of mu goes as u over, say, the base flow, which will go as c over u, which will go as 1 over m. So therefore, remember, the sine of mu goes as 1 over m as we previously derived. Look down here in the figure. Along a particular line, which is a characteristic line, which goes as in increments of j plus 1 to j minus 1, we have some particular angle with respect to the velocity vector known at point ij. Each point ij, or ij plus 1 and j minus 1, etc., along the whole characteristic line, will have some associated Mach angle mu. There's a velocity vector of each point, and then we can decompose it into its parts. Now, we will note that the derivatives of other flow variables are indeed indeterminate along the method of, uh, along the characteristic lines. So the definition of a characteristic line is where the derivatives of the other flow variables from the one we're advancing are invariant or indeterminate. We can now outline the general process of this philosophy of the method of characteristics. Let's first consider a region of supersonic flow in the so-called xy plane or space and let's assume that it's steady for now. And we'll solve for the flow field, given a known flow field in the upstream direction in three major steps. Let's outline these now. The first step is to find lines in space where the flow variables are continuous and where the so-called derivatives are indeterminate. That means, indeed, that these are the characteristic lines according to our definition of method of characteristics, of what a characteristic lines are, where the derivatives are indeterminate. Next, we'll combine the partial differential conservation equations where the ODEs are obtained that hold along the characteristic lines. These set of ordinary differential equations are called compatibility equations that, of course, are conservative, they're ordinary, and are obtained along the characteristic lines. The third major step in the philosophy of method of characteristics would be solving the compatibility equations step by step along each characteristic line starting from the initial conditions, which in this case is again a marching problem downstream. Now the entire flow field can then be mapped with this method. If we know the initial condition or boundary condition upstream, we can march downstream on the characteristic lines with the compatibility equations. Now the lines that we march down in two-dimensional flow will be left running and right running they will form a net, just like we saw in the Schlieren images previously in this class. And indeed, they'll depend on the so-called geometric locations. That is where the net is formed within the flow field. This is usually done numerically, but traditionally it was done with teams of computers when designing supersonic inlets and nozzles. What happens is that this process results in explicit algebraic equations for irrotational two-dimensional flow. 
You can, of course, form this for three-dimensional flow also. But we'll do the two-dimensional problem first. Let's do this now using this developed new philosophy, philosophy and method in the methods of characteristics. We'll consider a steady, adiabatic, two-dimensional, irritational supersonic flow. These are the assumptions of our method. But remember, we can relax some of these assumptions like two-dimensionality. Now, the governing equations for the full potential velocity are written in 564. We have not introduced this equation yet in your academic career. The equation reads 1 minus capital phi sub x squared over c squared phi x x plus 1 minus phi y squared over c squared phi y y minus 2 phi x phi y over c squared phi x y equals 0. Now this equation unfortunately is not derived in this class. It's usually derived in graduate school in gas dynamics. Nonetheless, this equation governs compressible full potential velocity. Now, in the undergrad, fluid dynamics and aerodynamics classes, usually you are asked to derive the full potential equation for incompressible flow. This is the equation which is equivalent for two-dimensional compressible flow. It's easy to write the three-dimensional equation which you can infer from 564. Here phi, of course, is the compressible full velocity potential. The sub x means that you're taking the partial derivative with respect to x. The sub y means you're taking the partial derivative with the y direction. The xx and yy are the second partial derivatives in the x and y direction, respectively. And the phi xy is the mixed second order partial derivative. Take a few minutes to review these ideas of partial derivatives. C is the local, the local speed of sound. Now remember, phi sub x here maps to u, which is velocity component in the x direction, and phi sub y maps to the velocity component in the y direction. Therefore, the velocity is equal to u of i hat plus v of j hat, which are, of course, the normal vectors in the x and y direction, respectively, of the velocity components. And therefore, we can write the velocity vector u as a function of phi sub x and phi sub y. Now, the derivative of phi is in the x direction is a function of x and y, as you've seen before. Therefore, we can differentiate d phi and dy, that is, differentiating u and v in 565 and 566, respectively. Let's write out these terms using basic calculus from our first calculus classes. We might write partial phi sub x partial x dx plus partial phi x partial y, which simplifies to phi x x dx plus phi x y dy. You can see, of course, now we've just combined the mixed and second order partial derivatives respectively, mixed derivative and, and second order derivative of phi in the x direction. We can also do the same operation for d phi sub y, which you can try on your own. Now indeed, we'll have a system of simultaneous linear algebraic equations in phi sub xx, phi sub yy, and phi xy. Let's take our equation and make the substitutions from the previous page and simplify 565 and 566. And of course, 567 we repeat. We'll once again have now, a system of equations where we have phi x x dx plus phi x y dy equals du, which is of course from 5, 6, 5 on the right hand side, written as du, which is the left hand side of 65. 566 maps and becomes 569, and 567 is now the modification of 564. Notice the change in the mixed derivative on the third term on the left hand side of 564. So we have this simultaneous set of equations. We could, of course, find them numerically through different rules. One method to solve, say, three algebraic equations, which are linear, is with Kramer's rule, which you should have learned, hopefully, in previous classes like linear algebra. If you haven't taken linear algebra, now is a good time to go and read about Kramer's rule, which gives us closed form solution of the three algebraic equation in terms of the determinants. Now there's many particular approaches to solve these types of equations, but we'll choose Kramer's rule because it's traditional. Now this allows us to directly write our three unknowns, phi xx, phi xy, and phi yy. With Kramer's rule, we'll directly choose and write phi sub xy, which is of course partial to phi, partial x, partial y. 
We can write that in 570 directly using Kramer's rule. And now I encourage you to review the theory so you can understand where the solution equation for phi x y comes from. It's written as, of course, the determinant of the upper and lower matrices of the coefficients of the system of equations shown in 567 to 569 of the slide deck. Notice the coefficients are 1 minus u squared over c squared, 2uv over c squared, and 1 minus v squared over c squared. The second and third row of coefficients are, of course, 0, dx, dy, and 0 and dx, dy, respectively, which we can see in the second and third row of the coefficient equations. Now we write the upper numerator as the determinant of the first, second, and third row coefficients. We call the numerator of, of course, Kramer's rule capital N. We are introducing this term as N, and in the denominator we'll call it capital D. So N is equal to the determinant of this coefficient matrix, and D is of course equal to the determinant of the lower coefficient matrix. Now look at the matrices carefully. Of course, in this case, we're setting some coefficients in particular to zero because, of course, we're solving for phi x, y, which is, of course, what's done in Kramer's rule. We'll now consider the following. Where the derivative of phi x, y has a specific value at some point a, which we previously shown in our chart. There might be some point a in the characteristic net, a known solution, perhaps. Now the solution of phi sub xy at a point a for any arbitrary small change in dxy in an arbitrary direction from a defined by dx and dy. So the solution will give us at point a a small partial derivative solution in the directions from the velocity vector defined in dx dy. Here's the schematic of this. In the x and y direction, we might have a particular method of characteristic on a particular line. We're at some point a, and we want to step in direction dx dy. We have a velocity vector, which we call capital V, or u, which is a function of little u and v in the i, unit i, and unit j direction, x and y respectively. So this little chart, 366, definitely illustrates the concepts which we show in the second and third points on 907 with the written solution of Kramer's rule. Let's make some more notes now. Remember, the direction from A given by dx and dy is chosen. The chosen direction of dx dy, we're not choosing arbitrary, is chosen so d equals zero and then e n equals zero. This way it keeps and allows phi x y to be finite. That is to keep our phi x y indeterminate will need partial u partial y equals partial v partial x. Now the lines in x y or the physical space for which d equals zero are the characteristic lines which we just defined earlier in this presentation. We'll then set d equals zero and find the following equation. Now we're not solving this equation with d equals zero because of course that is something we can't do, put d equals zero in the denominator. But we're just setting d equals zero and we find this particular equation. We'll find one minus u squared over c squared of dy squared plus du, uv over c squared dx dy plus one minus v squared over c squared dx squared equals zero. We can write this alternatively as one minus u squared over c squared times dy over dx squared plus two uv over c squared plus one minus v squared over c squared equals zero. Now, the term in dy dx indeed is the slope of the characteristic line as we just defined by setting d equals zero as the characteristic line. And then we can solve for dy dx using the quadratic formula from the previous equation. And after simplification, we can find equation 573. We'll see that dy, dy dx, which of course is the local slope of the characteristic at point A, will be equal to, of course, the quadratic formula with coefficients a, b, and c defined from 572. We substitute those in, and of course now we have an equation which represents the characteristic curves in physical space at all points A relative to the local flow properties. Now in terms of the square root, let's look at this particular formula. We have the square root of u squared plus v squared over c squared minus 1. We can look at that particular square root and rewrite it, and you'll see that we can substitute u squared plus v squared as capital U squared, the magnitude of the velocity, divided by the speed of sound squared, which is equal to m squared 
and we leave the minus 1 on the right-hand side. So you can see in the square root, you indeed have m squared minus 1. What does this mean about our approach physically? Here, if the Mach number is 1, then we have 1 minus 1 is 0, and there's only one real characteristic through each point in the flow, and therefore our system of partial differential equations is called parabolic. That corresponds to the transonic case. If the Mach number is less than 1, of course, then in the square root, we have an imaginary uh, value, and then the, fair, the PDE will be elliptic. We cannot use method of characteristics for subsonic flow. Subsonic flows are indeed elliptic in nature. And of course, that imaginary value ruins our solution approach because it doesn't correspond to a physical solution, but is certainly a valid mathematical one, but it violates other assumptions of the physics, which is why we don't see that in nature. We can then also see that for Mach number greater than 1, there's indeed two real characteristics through each point in the flow field. As we set M, say, 1.5 squared minus 1, this, of course, will give us two real roots. That means there's two real characteristics in the flow through each point in the flow field in two dimensions. So you can imagine in three dimensions, the characteristics are a little bit different. But in two dimensions, we'll have two characteristic lines in the supersonic flow through every particular point. What does this mean in practice? The takeaway is that we can try and seek steady, inviscid, supersonic and only supersonic flow according to the roots in a hyperbolic system, which is supersonic. And the method cannot be used for subsonic flows because, of course, of the imaginary characteristic problem of the solution using Kramer's rule by setting d equals 0 for invariant characteristics. Now let's examine further these characteristic lines. We found that dy dx along each characteristic can be rewritten. We show that m equals m squared, excuse me, as u squared over c squared. We can then introduce the angle theta. Let's look at the angle theta relative to 366. You'll see that theta indeed is the angle between the v component and u component of velocities at any point a. And of course, theta changes with the characteristic slope as you progress downstream along a particular streamline like this. So we also introduce theta in terms of cosine theta and sine theta of v cosine theta goes as u and v cos sine theta goes as v. We make those substitutions into our equation, which we just solved on 573, with m squared over c squared excuse me, u squared over c squared as uh, capital U. We make these substitutions and find equation 575 directly. Now that we made these substitutions, we can substitute in, of course, our definition of the Mach angle, which we just reviewed, which is mu with a function of sine. We make this substitution in 575 and we arrive at equation 576. Now, based on simple trigonometry, looking at 576, we have certain terms like the square root and the plus or minus on the right-hand side of the numerator. We can see that, of course, sine squared plus cosine squared indeed goes as 1. And, of course, 1 over sine squared mu minus mu square root can be written as 1 over tangent of mu. I'll let you try this substitution yourself. We can then simplify our equation further. Along each particular characteristic, dy dx, will have negative cosine sine over sine squared mu plus or minus 1 over tangent mu through the substitution 576 to 577, all over 1 minus cosine squared sine squared mu. We can then do additional simplification, and you'll see through these ratios that we can write each particular characteristic, dy dx, as tangent of theta minus plus of mu, respectively for the first and second characteristic. We don't write plus minus, we write minus plus. Notice that subtle difference. Here, of course, mu is the Mach angle, and theta is the local flow direction relative to u and v velocity components. And so that's how we relate the slope of each characteristic, where we have, of course, indeterminates. Let's interpret this equation graphically. Here again, we have the xy plane in figure 367 of this slide deck. We know the solution at one point A. At A, there's two characteristic lines now, which are at angles mu and mu, 
relative to the local velocity vector v. Remember, the angle of the velocity vector relative to the x-axis is theta, which is, of course, the local flow angle in the coordinate system. And this, of course, occurs along a particular streamline in a supersonic irritational compressible flow. We call this characteristic right here C plus and the other characteristic C minus. Know that they're not necessarily on straight lines because of course as the flow evolves they'll change. Now let's make some notes about this figure 367. Note that at A the streamlines make an angle theta with the x-axis that is their angle for the x-axis is theta, because of course the velocity vector is tangent to the streamline at A. And indeed there's going to be always two characteristics in the supersonic flow which we showed mathematically from the analysis of the quadratic equation. And they indeed pass through A at an angle mu above the streamline and angle mu below the streamline. The characteristics indeed are the Mach lines in the flow itself, which we see physically as the characteristic nets in Schlieren images. We then define the characteristic angle theta plus mu as C plus, which is the left running wave, characteristic wave, and theta minus mu is now called the C minus, which is the right running one. These form particular curves as the flow evolves, and you see that C plus and C minus, the characteristic lines, indeed change as the flow evolves and accelerates or deaccelerates downstream. Now we've already found the compatibility equations for d equals zero. There's a whole another set of equations which we can interpret for n equals zero. That's a numerator of Kramer's rule, which of course is just setting the determinant equal to zero and solving. For n equals zero, we find that the determinant of the numerator after simplification will become 580. You can try this out for yourself. You'll find dv over du goes as negative one plus u squared over c squared, all over one minus v squared over c squared dy dx. And so now we have dy dx is related to dv over du, the velocity vector components. Remember that these equations hold. They hold only on the characteristic lines themselves. Therefore, we can combine this particular equation with the previously developed equation. And we'll find, that is for dy dx previously developed, dv du, the left-hand side of 580, as negative 1 minus u squared over c squared, all over 1 minus v squared over c squared, all times negative uv c squared plus or minus the square root of m squared minus 1, all over 1 minus u squared over c squared. We can simplify 581 to 582. I'll let you try that yourself. It's very simple. Now remember, we previously defined that u equals the magnitude of the velocity times cosine theta and v equals u times sine theta, the flow angle at A, with respect to the x-axis. We can then write the previous equation, 582, this slide deck is 583. Now on the left-hand side we have u sine theta and u cosine theta. See this? On the right-hand side we can substitute in the Mach number definition of u squared over c squared. That's capital U magnitude, mind you. And, of course, also the theta definitions, which we just showed. We can then, after some simplification and a little bit of manipulation without any assumptions, find 584. And you'll find d theta is minus plus of the square root of m squared minus 1, and this should be a familiar term to you now, square root of m squared minus 1, times du over u. This is the so-called compatibility equation, which I alluded to earlier in this class for 2D steady compressible irrotational flow. It's a simple and beautiful equation. What does this equation describe? Remember, as we march downstream, the flow must change. This indeed describes the flow as a function of the local Mach number, the velocity, the change in velocity, and of course, change in flow direction. This describes exactly the variation of the flow along each particular characteristic line, the left running line and the right running line. What's fascinating about equation 584, if you're keen, you might notice that this also appears exactly in Prandtl-Meyer flow, and therefore you can imagine that this characteristic net is very much an expansion flow like Prandtl-Meyer's. This exact same term appears in the Prandtl-Meyer formulation.
Now we can integrate this equation, that is 584 of the slidetic, to find the particular algebraic compatibility equations. Let's integrate the equation and indeed you find two particular algebraic compatibility equations from the differential form. The first will be 585. Theta plus the Prandtl-Meier function will go as one constant k minus, and another equation will just be the minus equation, will be theta minus the Prandtl-Meier angle at which we'll call constant k plus. These are constants, theta plus Prandtl-Meier angle and theta minus Prandtl-Meier angle will be constants. They are constants along their particular characteristics, and indeed they're analogous to the Riemann invariance of unsteady flow, which we'll hopefully talk about later in this class. So you see, we can find the two constants along the left and right running characteristic lines by taking the local Mach number, finding the Prandtl-Meier function, and adding theta, and for k plus the constant, we would take the Prandtl-Meier function with its associated Mach number in A, which we know all state properties, to march downstream. And we would, of course, subtract it from the flow deflection angle theta, which we know from the local velocity vector. So now we have a system of equations which we can use to march downstream. The marching process from, say, A to, say, DA, a small distance downstream, is called a unit process. The unit process is the idea that we step downstream. This is a bit of an antiquated name. It's probably called a unit process because of the way computers were organized as teams of people before, of course, digital computers came along. Now, if we know the flow field conditions at two points in the flow, or along a particular line in two dimensions in this case, then we can find the conditions at a third point downstream. In fact, all points on lines, if they're discretized, downstream from the beginning line. For example, values of the Prandtl-Meier function and theta at point one, and the values of Prandtl-Meier function at two and theta two are known at points one and two respectively. Point three would be located at downstream from points one and two in an intersection where the left and right running characteristics C minus and C plus would go through and meet in point three. So geometrically, to go from point one to two along a particular line downstream, we could find the value at a discrete point downstream. For example, in figure 368, there's a body, there's a shock wave in front of it, and say we know the points at two locations in the flow by marching downstream, and we want to march downstream and find a point three. We can find the lines C minus and C plus and use trigonometry and geometry to find out where they intersect. That will be the physical location of point three, which we can then find its values through, of course, the constant values of K plus, K minus um, from the previous equations, and of course, the knowledge of dy dx in the previous formulation for the denominator. So here's a summary of these particular points for this particular unit process, which is the step of stepping one point downstream. Remember, we know that these equations hold because, of course, we just derived them. We know that theta 1 plus v1, excuse me, Prandtl-Meier function 1 equals k minus, and theta 2 minus Prandtl-Meier function at 2 equals k plus. So these are the values of the intersecting waves from 1 to 3 and 2 to 3 along these constants. We also know that point 3, theta 3 plus mu 3 equals k minus 3 equals k minus 1, and theta 3 minus mu 3 equals k plus 3, which is equal to k plus 2. This, of course, these are constants running through each particular point along the minus and plus characteristic lines, which do not change their constants. We can then solve these equations for a particular subscript 3, which I showed in 589 and 590, and we'll find these two particular beautiful equations, which define the unit process the step downstream from two new points. In 591, we'll have a new deflection angle, which will be 1 half, that's really the average, 1 half, of k minus 1 plus k plus 1, and a new Prandtl-Meier angle at 3.3, which will be, of course, the average of k minus 1 minus k plus 2. Excuse me, the difference, not average, in 592. Now, the conditions at point 3 are completely known now from the values at 1 and 2, and indeed we can recover the Mach number at 3 from V3, because of course we developed previously 
in these classes, the Pranelmeyer relation relates the Pranelmeyer function to Mach number. In this case, it's at subscript 3 because we're at point 3 in the unit process, one point down the flow from 1 and 2. Now, we can then, known M3, completely determine the pressure, temperature, and density through the isentropic relations, which are local to, of course, the point 3. Now, our method uses essentially linearization through linear lines between lines and points. That is, we go from 1 to 3 and 2 to 3 in the basic unit process. So we must indeed choose some sufficiently small dx and dy, which is of course their definition. Of course they can't be true differentials, they'll be just very, very, very small, small numbers. By choosing small dx and dy and doing thousands of unit processes from known values and marching downstream, we can indeed form curves. And these curves, we hope, through decreasing dx and y to smaller and smaller values, will converge to a solution. In fact, we find convergence for general two-dimensional compressible irritational flows as long as we remain supersonic. Now in practice, we take averages to find new points through an average of slopes. This is a simplification and assumption of the previously defined method. Here we might estimate as the average of the flow angles at 1 and 3 minus the average of the Mach angles for C minus. And for C plus we might approximate 1 half of the angles at 2 and 3 minus 1 half the summation of Mach angles. You can see this graphically in 369, which is how 593 and 594 are derived. Indeed, these are very, very good assumptions, approximations, for these particular C plus and C minus lines to march downstream from 1 to 3 and 2 to 3, which you can see 593 and 594 here in figure 369. Take a few seconds and see if you can understand this. Of course, locally between 1 and 3 and 2 and 3 all street lines, but from say 3 and 5 to 7, which would go another point downstream, you'll have a deflected line from 2 to 3 and 3 to 7. You might also what wonder what happens at the walls. Well, we can indeed find the conditions at the wall if we know the flow conditions within the flow before the wall, where the characteristic line impinges on it. Consider we introduce a new point 4, which is not at a wall, with a characteristic connecting at 2.5 at the wall. For example, 4 has a right running characteristic, which impinges on the wall, which we define as point 5. The character characteristic is then called k minus 4, is where point 4 will go as theta 4 plus the Pranelmeyer function of 4. We know theta 4 and of course the Pranelmeyer function of 4. Then at 5 we can simply solve and know along that characteristic we have a constant coefficient of k 4 minus which will be equal to k 5 plus, is where at the wall. That will be of course theta 5 plus nu 5. Remember, the flow of the wall must be tangent to the wall because we're in an inviscid flow. We assume that there's no viscosity, and therefore we have a slip condition, which is the flow is always tangent to the wall or zero at the wall, if the flow is zero, of course. But it's always tangent. The velocity vector is tangent, and the velocity normal to the wall is zero only. Therefore, we can define the Pranelmeyer function at 5 because, of course, we know the flow deflection angle at theta 5. And we can concisely write that the Pranelmeyer function at 5 is a Pranelmeyer function at 4 plus theta 4 minus theta 5, where theta 5, of course, is known as its tangent with the wall. It's the wall tangent vector. This all introduces a completely new concept called domains of dependence, which is critical in this class. Our analysis indeed shows that any disturbance in the flow are restricted to certain regions, which is the so-called domain of dependence. Likewise, the domain of influence means that anything or any disturbance in the domain of influence is dependent on whatever happens upstream at one particular point A. So remember, in steady flows, in supersonic flows, we do not propagate any disturbances upstream. Therefore, at any point A, it is completely dependent on any disturbance in the domain of disturbance in the supersonic flow. The regions that influence are only disturbed by anything that happens at point A itself. And of course, the domain of disturbance and the domain of influence of the flow 
is bounded by c plus and c minus, which we just found in this class. The counterexample is say there's a disturbance in the lower or upper part of the non-hatched areas. This area will never be dependent or influence the regions of dependence or influence respectively in figure 370. Take a few seconds to think about this and you might view it as an analogy. Say you have a stream and you throw a rock in a stream. The waves may never propagate fully upstream if the river is flowing fast. Only things downstream in the river will be affected by the ripples of waves in the water. This is not an exact but a very good analogy for the particular solution which we're discussing. Let's now apply and talk about this particular concept to nozzle design, and you can find a few examples in your books and try out in your homework and class. We require knowledge of the nozzle contours beyond the typical area ratio found from one-dimensional theory. Our one-dimensional theory does not describe the actual flow field itself, which is a restriction. We can then use the method of characteristics to design the divergent section of the nozzle from the throat to the exit, which is where, of course, if our nozzle is choked, we have supersonic flow. Now we'll need to know the particular exit conditions, that is when we stop marching in space, and the particular flow conditions. We'll assume that the flow starts our marching problem at the particular sonic line, which might be straight or in reality actually follows a quadratic curve found by none other than Theodore Meyer. We'll let our initial flow deflection angle be theta w, which is the angle to the wall with respect to the x direction. And for theta w, we'll let it increase as the nozzle is expanded. Of course, theta w will first be positive and then go back to zero as we progress down a typical convergent, divergent, de Laval, or method of characteristics nozzle. Here's a few examples of problems done with method of characteristics. Let's look at the upper picture in, of a nozzle wall. You'll see, indeed, as we march from initial point A and B, we can go to point 1. And from point 1, we would have two left and right running characteristics which merge on the wall. We would then turn the wall outward, and characteristic waves will bounce off, of course, and collide at 2, which is at the center of the nozzle. We can then march downstream, and eventually we let characteristic waves hit the outer wall, which turns into itself, which might cancel them out. So this is one way to design a nozzle. This is the most coarse method of characteristics case we can have as we march downstream from known conditions to, known to unknown conditions in the downstream direction from a sonic line. This design process is called the method of characteristics because we use this method of characteristics theory to design the nozzles. Indeed, there's a whole class of nozzles called method of characteristic nozzles, an infinite family of them for Mach numbers and different, um, basically, uh, initial conditions which design isentropic flow. They represent the design of a nozzle which operates isentropically and on design without any losses at supersonic speeds. What a wonderful thing. Let's talk about a basic nozzle design process for simplicity, very briefly. We'll seek to compute and graph the contour of a two-dimensional nozzle for a design Mach number of 2.4. If we want to do an axisymmetric nozzle, of course we would need an axisymmetric form of the method of characteristics or the full three-dimensional form, which we didn't derive in this class, but it can be easily found in many advanced textbooks. Now we assume that indeed there's a linear sonic line at the throat. This violates, of course, physics and the proof of Theodore Meyer that it's quadratic. We'll then find a resultant area ratio of 2.33 of the nozzle, which is within, indeed, 3% of the one-dimensional, quasi-one-dimensional theory which we previously showed in the class. Indeed, this is a more accurate solution because we're finding the flow field everywhere and guaranteeing it's isentropic and supersonic as we march downstream. And we can reduce the increments to smaller and smaller values of dx and dy to approach and converge solution. Here's some graphical solution in the upper left showing two starting points which merge in the C. You can indeed see that there's initial flow deflection theta sub w max from the initial angle. In the lower left shows a more high fidelity solution where we calculate the whole characteristic net, initially from A and B at the wall. 
which we then see merges as one, and multiple characteristics come off the initial location with a very high turning angle. These all merge as we move downstream and we know each unique value of the flow at all these positions. Indeed, the upper wall doesn't have reflections of characteristic lines. Why? Because we choose an angle theta, which cancels out the right running characteristic. That's how we choose the angle of the wall where each characteristic wave hits it, and therefore no reflection happens and we find an isentropic flow. If we, for this initial condition, diverged or had theta values which are different at the wall, then of course we might have formations of shocks or indeed strong expansion waves at the wall, which we see in many practical nozzles. This is a very specific design. There's many computer programs which are also written. This is an example MATLAB program written for method of characteristics for a nozzle flow. Using method of characteristics, we're changing theta to cancel out the right running waves and we find a particular axisymmetric nozzle with this outer line defined as the expansion section from the throat. Let's summarize our findings today. We've talked about the method of characteristics, its derivation, and practical applications within a supersonic flow and what happens at the wall. We also talked about the wall boundary condition and how waves reflect. We also showed that we can choose the wall boundary condition in terms of flow deflection to cancel out reflected waves and find beautiful isentropic nozzles. As you imagine, this can also be applied to, of course, inlets or any other part of the flow where you want to have supersonic isentropic tropic flow. Sometimes the method of characteristics indeed terminates at particular regions of the flow and then you have to use other methods to keep marching downstream or turn to particular numerical methods. Indeed this is a type of numerical method and we'll try and have some class examples and of course homework for you. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.